tonight is We're going. deep in the 2024 presidential campaign, and so is the media frenzy. But when it comes to politics and the media, should we believe everything we see? In 2018, NBC incorrectly reported that Trump stayed home at Christmas time. Time falsely claimed Trump removed the bust statue of Martin Luther King. CNN edited Trump's remarks. After Biden was sworn in, what did we find? This week, a special investigation. We compare the record of media mistakes under two presidents. What connections have you made between the unions and political influence? They affect nearly everything from election reform to taxing and spending. And when it comes to unions and politics, we follow the money and find an imbalance of influence. Our report shows that about 96 percent of union political spending goes to Democrats. And a major American university is severing ties with Qatar, an Islamic country, and its controversial funding. We've learned that funding by Qatar in particular uh, has influenced American academia. The aftermath of an explosion in anti-Semitism at American universities. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. We're now moving into the most heated phase of the 2024 presidential campaign. Few things are as important to the two top candidates, Biden and Trump, as getting positive coverage in the news. Donald Trump had a decided disadvantage in 2016 and 2020 when it comes to the traditional press and social media. Here at Full Measure, we've documented the media's uniquely harsh treatment of Trump since he first declared his run for the White House including an explosion in the trend of false reporting by formerly well-respected national news outlets. We've also been tracking media mistakes under the Biden presidency to see if he'd fall victim to the same syndrome. In other words, is the media making an unprecedented number of sloppy but innocent errors, or is their behavior part of a calculated strategy? Today's cover story, What the Record Shows. When President Biden spent last Christmas on vacation with family, he continued the longest string in two decades of a U.S. president not visiting the troops during the holiday. But there was no criticism in the press like there had been of his predecessor. Thank you. President Trump. With Trump, the media was eager to blare negative headlines, even when false. In 2018, NBC incorrectly reported that Trump stayed home at Christmas time, the first U.S. president since 2002 to skip visiting the troops. The news went global. But it wasn't true. The media had jumped the gun. Trump and First Lady Melania left the White House Christmas Day to visit U.S. soldiers in Iraq. On Thanksgiving, Newsweek made a similar error falsely reporting that Trump was spending the holiday golfing at Mar-a-Lago in Florida. But the reporter had fabricated the golf story. Trump flew to Afghanistan on Thanksgiving to again be with the troops, making Trump the only president in U.S. history to visit troops in a combat zone both on Thanksgiving and so close to Christmas, though the press never reported that. Three years into the Biden presidency, it's clear. Trump was treated with unique unfairness by error-riddled reports in the media, always cutting in a negative direction. There's been no similar trend under Biden. But first, a reminder of just a few of the worst media mistakes about Trump. CNN claimed Nancy Sinatra was not happy her father's song was played at Trump's inauguration. But Nancy Sinatra responded, that's not true. I never said that. Why do you lie, CNN? Time falsely claimed Trump removed the bust statue of Martin Luther King from the Oval Office. TMZ reported Trump changed Black History Month to African American History Month, but Presidents Obama, Bush, and Clinton had all called it African American History Month. BBC, The Guardian, and others reported that Trump wasn't bothering to listen to a speech by Italy's prime minister since he wasn't wearing translation headphones. Turns out he was wearing a translation earpiece. 
Newsweek and others reported Poland's first lady refused to shake Trump's hand, but later had to admit she did. CNN edited Trump's remarks to make it seem as though he didn't realize Japan builds cars in the U.S., but the full statement made clear that he does. You've been creating jobs for our country for a long, long time. Several Japanese automobile industry firms uh, have been really doing a job. CNN also edited a video to make it seem like Trump impatiently dumped fish food in the water at Japan's palace. But he'd followed the lead of Japan's prime minister. Newsweek claimed Ivanka Trump plagiarized one of her own speeches, which is impossible since plagiarizing is stealing someone else's work. The UK Telegraph apologized for at least eight mistakes in an article criticizing Melania Trump. The New York Times, AP, CNN, and others excerpted a Trump comment as if he'd called all illegal immigrants animals. These aren't people. These are animals. And which- Later corrections noted he'd been referring to members of the murderous MS-13 criminal gang. The New York Times Magazine and CNN shared a story showing children illegally brought into the U.S. supposedly in cages. But the article and photos were actually from the Obama administration. Agence France Press mistakenly reported that more than 100,000 children brought in by illegal immigrants were being held in detention. That was actually the total number in 2015 under Obama. Time and others showed a crying Honduran child to illustrate Trump separating illegal immigrant parents from children, but the child hadn't been separated from her parents in the U.S. MSNBC falsely claimed Trump banned the Red Cross from visiting the immigrant children. The Red Cross said that wasn't true. MSNBC also falsely claimed that Trump had talked about exterminating Latinos, but later corrected that and apologized. NBC News misidentified the focus of Trump's praise in a speech as Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Actually, Trump was talking about Union General Ulysses S. Grant. And his name was Grant, General Grant. The Washington Post and others falsely reported that Trump supporting pro-life Catholic high school students were the aggressors in a confrontation in Washington, D.C. Several news outlets featured an empty podium at Trump's 4th of July celebration in 2019 and said he didn't draw crowds, but the photo was taken before the event. The actual crowd was huge. The New York Times and others implied Trump hadn't paid income taxes for 18 years, but the record shows he'd paid a higher rate than Democrats Bernie Sanders and President Obama. Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal reported special counsel Robert Mueller had subpoenaed Trump's bank records. That wasn't true. Politico falsely reported that Trump owed the Bank of China tens of millions of dollars in a loan coming due as he dealt with China on coronavirus. Not true. MSNBC falsely reported that Trump had loans with Russian co-signers. Slate.com falsely claimed a Russian bank server had been illicitly communicating with Trump Tower. And the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, and many others falsely reported that the Hunter Biden laptop scandal story was unsubstantiated or Russian disinformation. The New York Times reported that Trump seized on hydroxychloroquine as a miracle cure. Trump never said that. And it may work and it may not work. But if it doesn't work, it's nothing lost by doing it, nothing. CNN and others criticized Trump for tweeting that Alabama would likely be affected by Hurricane Dorian. But official advisories had put Alabama in a projected impacted area. Vox.com tweeted that Trump suggested he'd been a 9-11 first responder. He'd said the opposite. And I was down there also. But I'm not considering myself a first responder. Multiple media falsely claimed Trump was golfing during a U.S. raid that captured the head of ISIS in Syria and that a White House photo of Trump had been staged. But Trump was at the White House. ABC aired video showing what it called a slaughter against Kurds by Turkey after Trump withdrew U.S. troops. But the video was file tape of a training show in the U.S. And USA Today connected the eagle on a Trump campaign T-shirt with a Nazi eagle, later admitting the eagle is a longtime U.S. symbol, too. 
I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. After Biden was sworn in, what did we find? The media made fewer major mistakes, and the ones they did make still cut against Trump or somehow favored Biden and his agenda. Here are just a few examples. The New York Times published a fabricated claim that Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick was killed by pro-Trump supporters who struck him in the head with a fire extinguisher. However, Sicknick died from a stroke. The Pointer Institute's PolitiFact, The Washington Post, and others falsely said the idea of COVID coming from a lab was a debunked conspiracy theory. WebMD, USA Today, and others incorrectly dubbed the 2020 Sturgis, South Dakota motorcycle rally a COVID super spreader event. Data showed the rally had way below the national average of cases. Associated Press falsely stated that 70% of recent calls to Mississippi poison control were from people who'd taken ivermectin for COVID. The actual number was reportedly 2%. USA Today falsely claimed President Biden only checked his watch after the return of U.S. soldiers killed in Afghanistan. In fact, Biden repeatedly checked his watch during the ceremony, as families of the fallen soldiers claimed. Mediaite falsely declared that Joe Biden had not referred to baseball great Satchel Paige as a Negro. In fact, he'd done just that. You know, I've adopted the attitude of the great Negro at the time. His name was Satchel Paige. And the Washington Post claimed Senator Tom Cotton was wrong to say murderers like the Boston Marathon bomber would qualify for COVID stimulus checks under Biden. Turns out the convicted killer did receive a stimulus check in prison. Trump sued CNN for $475 million for calling his challenges to the 2020 election the big lie. He argued it defamed him because the big lie is a Nazi term. The judge threw out the case saying CNN was using the term as an opinion and it didn't necessarily link Trump to Hitler or genocide of Jews. Head on full measure how workers unions are impacting the 2024 presidential election. Millions of Americans pay union dues and a lot of that money ends up in the pockets of politicians mostly Democrats. In 2020, the largest union, the Teamsters, endorsed Joe Biden. This time, they also met with Trump. That meeting led to the first donation by Teamsters to the GOP in years. And as one member of the board called it, a tacit endorsement of Trump. Today, Lisa Fletcher follows the money to trace the political influence of unions. What connections have you made between the unions and political influence? Unions are the most powerful players in every state house. They really dominate not only their sphere of influence, so, you know, think teachers unions affecting educational policy. They affect nearly everything from election reform to taxing and spending. David Osborne works with the Commonwealth Foundation, which advocates for less government involvement in the economy. Osborne co-authored a report revealing how those unions spend their membership dues and discovered politics dominates the equation. It turns out that about 60 percent of overall union political spending comes from membership dues. Is it supposed to be that way? So that old union political line about membership dues not going to politics is officially dead. Um, Union dues are used for politics all the time, everywhere from local political spending um, on school board races, on, um, on governorships and house races. Not only that, but they also use it and send it to super PACs and dark money groups who are interested in affecting elections all throughout the country. Do you think union members know that their union dues are going to political campaigns? Many of them definitely do not know that their union dues are going to fund political campaigns. You know, union members should be able to control how their money is spent, and yet they're not. There is a First Amendment problem with, uh, with public employees having their money taken out of their paychecks and then used for political causes with which they may or may not agree. How are unions being rewarded for putting certain political candidates in office? If they can get a different school board elected, if they can get a different House member elected or even a governor elected, then they have the ability to sit across the table from someone who owes them.
That tactic put into play in 2022, when Josh Shapiro, then the top recipient of government union money, won the governor's race in Pennsylvania. Once elected, he returned the favor to unions representing service employees and state, county and municipal employees. And within a year, he's already negotiating collective bargaining agreements with some of his biggest campaign contributors. They received huge raises, about 20 percent raises from what they had received in previous. A similar play was made for Brandon Johnson, a former Chicago Teachers Union organizer elected mayor there last April. The teachers unions were very much involved in that and they threw their weight around. Our report shows that about 96 percent of union political spending goes to Democrats. It's very unbalanced. And really, even if you assume that membership is tilted in one way or the other, it's certainly not tilted 96 to 4. Government unions aren't the only ones making big contributions to Democrats and liberal groups. So far in this election cycle, almost 20 million has come from the Carpenters and Joiners Union. Unite Here, representing food service and manufacturing workers, has given 4 million. And the Communications Workers of America, representing employees in health care and customer service, have contributed more than 3.5 million. Far less for Republicans and conservative groups. And when labor does well, everybody does well. Though cash is crucial for political parties, so is a union endorsement for a presidential candidate, particularly from one in a swing state like Michigan, where President Biden recently picked up support from the United Auto Workers, whose 400,000 members will support him at the polls in November and potentially hand him the state. That approval grew from a visit the president paid the union last September when he made history by being the first modern president to support striking workers by joining their picket line. You deserve the significant raise you need. In 2020, unions contributed more than 27 million to Biden and liberal groups supporting him. Unions gave Trump less than $360,000. This time around, Biden has a similar advantage. So far, unions have contributed at least $3 million to his campaign. Trump shows no union contributions to date, but he is still competing for their vote. We just had a meeting with the Teamsters, and one of the biggest problems they have is millions of people are pouring into the country. And that's a killer for the Teamsters, and I'm going to stop it. And that's why the Teamsters, I think, support me now. I don't know. In January, former President Trump met with members of the Teamsters Union. It appears to have paid off. The Teamsters gave $45,000 to the GOP, the first major donation in years. Yeah, I mean, we have a good shot, I think. They like what I do. Uh, they never had better a better four years than they had during the Trump administration, I can say that. Can you think of anything on the Republican side that has as much money and influence over politics as unions do? on the Democratic side? No, I, there's no real comparison. We often talk about leveling the playing field because unions should be involved in politics to some degree. Sure, they're an organization with interests and yet they have all of these subsidies that make it a lot easier for them to engage in politics than any other organization. What do you see happening in 2024? Well, unfortunately, I think this trend is only increasing. Since 2012, union spending has basically tripled. It's only going to increase. The more that they see that they can get something out of government, the more they'll spend to try to impact it. So what is something else that they can expect as unions to get from the candidate they back? Well, two years ago, President Biden spent about $36 billion in taxpayer money to bail out a fund that provides retirement benefits for private union members and retirees, about 360,000 of them. And just ahead of the Biden-Harris campaign in the last election cycle, the Teamsters Union endorsed that ticket. Could be worth it to them for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. And coming up, following the money on anti-Jewish sentiment on campus. An update to our reporting about Qatar and its funding of numerous U.S. universities where anti-Semitism has exploded. Texas A&M recently ended its contract with the Qatari Foundation that supports its branch campus in that country. The change followed release of a study by the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism and Policy. 
We spoke with Charles Small, the head of the group, in December. We've learned that funding by Qatar in particular uh, has influenced American academia when it comes to issues of democracy, the West, the notion of America, American society, the United States in the world, and when it comes to the Jew Jewish people in Israel. And basically Qatar, uh, its, its spiritual leaders of the Qatari royal family is the Muslim Brotherhood. A series of investigative reports by Small's group points to the Muslim nation of Qatar, a key supporter of the terrorist group Hamas and the biggest foreign funder of American universities. Can you explain what Qatar's special interest might be in undermining the West and promoting this idea of anti-Semitism? So basically the Muslim Brotherhood wants to destroy Israel and they're Islamists and they believe all of the Islamic world has to be under control of uh, Islamist ideology. They want to create a caliphate. They want to get rid of Western interests, Christians, Jews, moderate Muslims who don't believe in their ideology and replace it with a, an extremist caliphate and in doing so weaken the West. A crucial facet of Qatar's funding of American universities is a massive facility near Qatar's capital dubbed Education City. Since 2003 we've built a marketplace of ideas where East meets West. Education City hosts on-site campuses in Qatar for Texas A&M, Georgetown, Cornell, Northwestern, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Carnegie Mellon. I am a Northwestern graduate. I'm John Matt Georgetown, Carnegie Mellon University. Small says Qatar's contract with Texas A&M is especially concerning. Texas A&M University is proud to support the Qatar National Vision 2030. Texas A&M has access to two nuclear reactors for teaching and research. The school has accepted more than a billion dollars from Qatar for more than 500 research projects, including sensitive nuclear research. We know that Hamas, their leadership lives in Qatar and is supported by the Qatari regime. Are they sharing some of this military secrets or research with them? Other than Texas A&M, the other universities mentioned, Georgetown, Cornell, Northwestern, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Carnegie Mellon reportedly still have Qatari connections. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, post-Obamacare, more Americans have health insurance, but something else has happened. Overall, medical costs have skyrocketed, and no longer can we call the doctor and expect to be seen quickly. I had to get a referral to even be able to see her. Like, she doesn't accept new patients like it was one of her current patients. Two-year wait. Got on, got the appointment. A couple days before, they called me and said, she's no longer with the practice. Growing wait times to see the doctor next week on Full Measure. See you then, everybody. Thanks for watching.